Good morning, everyone. Oh, I promised you, look what I have here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Caitlin, how are you doing? Doing really well, thank you, Roman. Okay, first of all, it was super awesome having brunch slash dinner, whatever that happened to be, it took a long time. <laughs> and <clears throat> I appreciate you, first of all, of what you do. A, because there are not many people who do what we do, educate, um, and go beyond what textbooks tell us and then yeah. up into new areas and, and test things and, and observe things. And then later, 10 years later, somebody comes up with the idea, oh, we have a scientific proof. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Art I'm glad you guys figured science. it out. Finally. Yeah, science is really slow. I love it. I'm a geeky scientist, but science is I really think slow. It's important. It, science is not here to show us the way. It's to pave it. Yes. And I think like people them. like you are important because you guys go around with a bush knife, clear up, tell him to come over. He has important things to bring. <laughs> he is, bless his soul. This is my other half and he is wonderful. I, <laughs> it's because it's a different kind of tea. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Hey, how's it going there? You're next. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, That's what are we talking torture. about today? Oh, yeah. So, we're having, um, of course, because of COVID, everything is shut down. So, we're going to sit up under a tent next to a food truck. And so, we start talking about stuff, sharing information. And then, on our way out, you threw something out there about, what was that? Error-free error free living. living. And I was like, whoa, whoa, what is that? Like, okay, let me explain to you. And I, what did I say then? Don't tell me anything. I'll get you on the show. We're going to talk about that because I need witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, let, let me introduce you. Okay, and now I'm getting very tactical. Dr. Caitlin Coberly. And I know you don't like these titles, but you know what? People need to know there are scientists out there and, and professionals. They merge both things together. And then they add passion to it and then they had this need to communicate better with dogs and, and bring that relationship with dogs to the next level and it's a it's a long but i want to read it because it's totally worth it i really appreciate you so <laughs> dr caitlin Cumberly is a certified dog behavior consultant through the iaabc international association animal behavior consultants um, she is a full member of Pet Professional Guild and the founding member of Dog Training 101 Trainer Cycles. So you also help other trainers. Yeah, very much. Okay, now this is the point where everybody gives thumbs up. And by the way, would like to hear where you guys are from and where you're watching on, because I know some of you guys are very far away. Hi, Diane. Yeah, interesting subject, right? I have no clue what we're going to talk about. So you guys <laughs> can unfriend me after that or extra love me. So um, she specializes in working with aggression, canine know. compulsive disorders. Caitlin has been forced and fear-free <clears throat> for 10 years. You may know her through her Facebook group, Dog Training 101, the free help group created towards building a happy life with your dog, period. Next chapter. Chaplin lives with a small farm in Oregon neighbors and her seven dogs. You have more dogs than I do and three okay. elderly horses. And Caitlin's philosophy on coercion free training stems from her over 40 years experience training multiple species, right? Multiple species and original trained breaking horses. Oh, I like that. Term, broke out of it. So she is a crossover. Yay. Um, she found it out in a gentle trust-based approach for better with a sore old mayor who was entrusted to her. Later, she asked if people had training pointers for over 200 years without any colleagues. Yes. It's, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Is there a connection issue? That's me, maybe, likely, most likely. <laughs> One, two, okay. Um, how about you guys read it yourself? Go to her website, okay? It's somewhere out there. I'm going to post it and read it. If you guys don't like my voices, scratches, miss my beard. How about that? 
Okay. So, um, in implementing her eight pointers, she developed a collaborative and trust-based approach to hunting that she still uses today. Her love for the bad dogs has led her to try basic trust-based approaches to working with aggressive and reactive dogs. With virtually 100% success and rapid process, progress, she now considers these trust-based fundamental approaches to be, to be not only the most ethical, but the most effective and time-sensitive methods available. Yeah. Great. We are more than you. Some like it. <laughs> yep. Caitlin takes every opportunity to work with the wide variety of breeds and species in the past, uh, in the past working extensively with falcons. Falcons. That's cool. I like it. Uh, in the past, working extensively with falcons and other birds of prey, as well as multiple agricultures and wild species, up to including goldfish and spiders. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Now we are in. I am in Eugene, Oregon, and you are in Oregon Lebanon, too. Oregon, Lebanon, yeah. Oregon. Okay. Just up the street. <laughs> just, just an hour up the street. No, right. neighborhood. <laughs> where are you guys from? So, how about you guys warm up your hands and start typing in where you're from? And and by the way, when you do that, you want to accept Face um, Streamyard to post your name because otherwise we have no person. We don't know which person it is. <laughs> and then some bird. Some falcon came by and told me that Caitlin has to a gift for us, for some people who are really interactive today and at least share that video because most people need to learn about it. Now, I have a couple of questions since we talked about that last time. Um, okay, here we go. Wow, we are internationally. Virginia, anybody else? I know somebody. You can see where you're from. We don't have a problem with Canadians, with Australians <laughs> and Brits, right? <laughs> Here you go. Okay, so tell me about that error-free thing. Yeah, so I wanna start out with, in your, um, your guests might be familiar with error-free learning, which is, um, gosh, I think this was developed probably in somewhere in the, <laughs> the 1950s or 60s by Marty Seligman and some of those really big name uh, psychologists. And the idea behind this is, is that we don't need to make mistakes in, learn, in order to learn how to do something. We can learn how to do something by, you know, through many, many different methods that are, that are completely frustration-free, error-free, learn by approximations. We get lots of reinforcements along the way. We can learn by mimicry. And we effectively can learn um, oftentimes much faster if we are giving very, very small uh, approximations to the end goal. So, you know, if you come along to, um, say a blueberry bush at the right time, what you find is this bush has just a ton of blueberries on it, summer, I guess. And you walk up to it and it's, it's virtually impossible not to be able to pick a blueberry and eat it, right? So you can pick a whole bunch of blueberries and then as it, as those blueberries get more scarce, this, so my point is, is this is a very natural way of learning as those blueberries get more scarce, you're going to get better and better at seeing them and at picking them and at finding those blueberry bushes out in that big sea of, you know, mountains and shrubs and other trees. So it's, it's you know, it's not a stressful way of finding out about blueberry bushes. It's not like, oh, you know, I have to hunt for blueberries for 10 years before I finally find them. Like my poor friends who are trying to learn about uh, mushroom hunting, right? <laughs> are you are you posing something? I just had mushroom this morning. I have a hard time finding myself. Yeah, yeah. I love lots of friends out trying to find um, chanterelles right now. And you know, they've, they've heard about where they exist and, and everything like that. And so they're out and they're looking in the burns and they're looking at this specific elevation and they're struggling to find them. And it's very frustrating for them. And many of them have given up 
because it's so frustrating. So there's some wonderful trainers out there who have perfected this idea of error-free learning. And um, we have a video of, uh, let me just drop a couple of names. Jan Ostergaard over in the Netherlands is really amazing. And then Sarah Owings has done some really nice work with this. Um, and we have a little video clip of what she's doing. And she's, let me set it up for you. She's got a shelter dog there who's got a problem with mugging and biting hands. And mm -hmm. it's, the dog gets very frustrated. And when she's when she tries to train this using our old standard method of just, you know, holding out the hand and waiting for the dog to get frustrated and try something else rather than directly going for her hand. It, you can see that the dog is struggling with it and dogs often give up or they bite or, you know, they just really have a problem with it. So she said, let's do a workaround. Let's find a different way to do this. So it's not frustrating for the dog. And that's what this little video clip is. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so let's look at that a little bit. Um, let me, Clean it out here and let's start the video. Do we have any barking in the background? I don't think so, right? Not from my dogs. No, oh, in the video, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> here we go. So this is where you see that dog just, he's just poking at that hand, trying to get those treats out. And he's just not, he's struggling. She's struggling. Of course, what we want the dog is to sit politely or something like that and, and not bug us for the treats. We want them to wait for the treats to come to them. Good. So the <laughs> System processing. I like her marker. She's not yelling at it. Yeah, no, she's a beautiful trainer. She's just amazing. <laughs> okay, so 47 second session, 28 errors. This dog is really trying and not getting success. Um, so and I can go on about impulse control exercises too. Right. <laughs> So what is she doing there? She put treats on the bed. Yeah. Right? So she's okay. she, the dog walks in, she tosses some treats on the bed and notice that her hands are behind her. The dog. Right. So she moves the triggers. Yeah. So the, yeah, right. So, and watch um, what happens with those hands is particularly the right hand is very, very interesting. Dog looks up at her and he gets a treat. Good. Looks up at her, gets a treat. Good. Good. Yeah, it, it helps the dog not to focus on one hand and go back, back again or CD about it. Yep. Good. So many subtle things she does here. Yeah, hello, Canadians. <laughs> Yay, Canada. And look how happy that dog is. Look at that little tail wag. I love that yeah, little yeah, tail yeah. wag. <laughs> the dog says, I got this. I got that. I know what's going on. Every time I look at her, I get a treat. So Zero errors. I like that. Zero errors, yep. See where that right hand is right now, how close that hand is. Yeah, it's very close to the body, basically, and start 
start implementing it. But you see how, how the dog struggles to kind of keep his brain together. Mm -hmm. He's looking at that right hand. And that, but that right hand is, is no longer behind the back. Now it's beside her. Right. He's looking at it, he's looking at it. And he looks up at her and he gets the marker and he gets the reward. That right hand is now on her thigh. Yeah, she's slowly, slowly getting her hand to be part of that game. Exactly. <laughs> Note the music in the background. Okay. Very good girl. Very good girl. Wow. So no, there's no way a trainer can admit he was a mistake. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Dog <She's>, one. <laughs> she is an amazing trainer. I've seen some, she's got some video of a, of a dog whose frustration levels were so bad yeah. that, you know, for, for ball play that he actually came in and latched onto her breast and shoulder area. And uh -huh. she switched over to this errorless kind of training and was able to solve his obsession with the ball by by doing this work around by by teaching the good behavior without having that ball you know cause the frustration without having to withhold the ball you know and this kind of thing so i, I like the approach i like that she created um an errorless environment with minimum triggers like she couldn't remove herself from there that's why I'm saying minimum. And she had a calming music. She calmed herself down. She felt very grounded. She's not all over the place. She's not making a show. She's really observing. She she records what she's doing right now. That's I like that. Um, it's not a show off. It's not something that's make the dog fail so she looks better. Right. I like that. Um, I see she has good value treats. She doesn't have the plastic bag. Try to get the streets out or the jar. Like you try to get out the jar, right? Right. <laughs> um, so, um, love this. Roman and Caitlin, thank you. You're welcome. Um, huh. <laughs> yeah, you want it, right? Yeah, it will be recorded and be available later for you guys who don't have time for this. But, you know, you know, you guys are busy, and of course, we recorded it so you guys can join. But, however, since we're sitting here and talking, you should follow Caitlin and our channel to get notifications. The video you can find on YouTube and you can find on our main pages. So, um, okay, I like it. Um, I have to admit, I have a similar version. Unfortunately, I don't have this perfect environment. I usually have to go to a client and, and do stuff. Um, I wish I knew earlier, I have a couple of videos to go similar with that. Um, with similar excitement, I think we're going to do another session for that. We're going to talk that another fun. time. Yeah, How to. can we control excitement and anxiety without using shock colors? Right. And right. delivering the message. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so um, I have couple, does anybody have any questions here or uh, am I free to kind of ask on your behalf? <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to hear questions. I did want to, to make the transition over to error-free living because error-free training is one thing. And that's that, you know, five minutes a day when we spend, you know, we get out our treat pouch and we you yeah. know, stand there and we do all this formal stuff. But we know, <laughs> we know that the dogs are learning 24 hours a day when they're with us. Well, they're sleeping, but, you know, um, they, they're learning all the time that they're with that they're with us so i thought about you know i started thinking about this and thinking you know how do we how do we translate this error-free learning into a very natural easy way for humans to live with their dogs so we have a lot of problem behaviors that are associated with 
day-to-day -day life. Like everybody wants to know how to train a great recall and how to stop their dog from jumping on them and how to, you know, dogs have all of these demand behaviors which are frustrating for the humans. So how do we, uh, so we know that, that um, you know, frustration and stress causes a lot of these behavior problems. And so how do we get a fantastic recall in normal day-to-day -day living where we're not, you know, always walking around with our treat pouch? How do we get dogs that are calm and happy? And if I can show a lovely example here, don't mind the mess in my house. But, you know, this is what my dogs are doing right now. I'm on a live video feed and my dogs aren't pawing at me. They're not, they're not getting all frustrated. Uh, they're not locked in another room in a crate. I don't have to give them a Kong. They're taking a nap, right? How do we get this for our normal day-to-day -day regular clients? And I started thinking about, can we translate error-free learning into error-free living? And okay, geeky scientist alert here. Why do dogs do behaviors? they do behaviors in order to get needs met. So if we can meet their needs as those needs arise, we can uh, we can reduce their stress, reduce their anxiety, reduce their frustration, and reduce or eliminate those demand behaviors which are so frustrating for us. We can reduce their anxiety-related behaviors that are causing them to bark at the window or, um, uh, you know, uh, paw at us and things like that. We can increase their recall because, um, Great question, Zita. Um, there are, there's always going to be a place for training. And I'm not going to say that there isn't, but Wendy, Wendy's right on target here. Meet their innate needs. So dogs have a need for entertainment. They have a need to go out and hunt, right? It's a, it's a predator species. It needs to go hunt. We don't have to kill things, but they need to go out and do this searching, digging, running, whatever. Um, they, they need to be a part of their environment. They need to, you know, they need to eat. They need to sleep. They need to pee. They need to poop. Um, we can use all of those biological needs to drive our behaviors as the human caretakers and we also know that those biological needs occur in a pattern throughout the day. Like us as humans, we sleep. You know, it varies from human to human, but pretty much, you know, 10 o'clock at night to six o'clock in the morning, plus or minus a few hours. Almost all of us are asleep at 4 a.m. unless you've got some kind of insomnia or something like that. And we know that if we don't allow the humans to sleep during those times that they are sleep deprived and they're cranky and you know they can't think very well etc 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 right so one of the things that we can do is we can set up a sleep environment at a natural biologically predetermined time to give them the best rest possible to to reduce that frustration anxiety and the baggage that comes with not getting good quality sleep. That's an easy one to talk about for us humans. Um, dogs have polyphasic sleep, so they're, and they're very flexible. So, you know, that it, we can get away with a little bit less precision in dog sleep patterns than we have with our humans. But with the, with the dogs, their desire to eat um, is pretty much my dogs, at least, I've found that they, their hunger peaks sometime shortly after dawn and right around sunset, right? So if we use those times of day to feed them, 
we can often reduce a lot of the puppy nipping. Uh, yeah, hierarchy of dog needs. Um, it, this comes from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I absolutely love it. It's super important. Um, and, you know, so this is something where biological needs often occur in a very, uh, very nice pattern uh, through the day. Something like emotional needs may be less fixed to a clock, but they're still very, very important. Um, so we can, we can fit in some of those kinds of needs when it's convenient for our schedule. But let me give an example from my life and when things were really, really stressful in my life. I was working a, a really big job up in Portland, um, it, which was, sorry, a two hour drive away. So it was two hour drives there, two hour drive back. And oftentimes, you know, it, it was a six to 10 hour work day. So my was really hard time in my life. My dogs were left home alone oftentimes for 10 hours a day. And there was a lot of stress behaviors related to that, including fighting between the dogs. Now I had babysitters coming by to take them out for walks and everything like that, but it was a really stressful time for them. I solved a lot of our behavior problems by simply taking them for a long walk at dawn off leash when I got up in the morning and we would go out, we would take our walk. I would let them determine how long the walk was. So, and that usually ended up being 40 minutes to an hour. They were young, athletic, extremely motivated dogs. As dogs get older, those walks get shorter. But take them, taking them for that dawn walk, then they'd come in and I'd spend a few minutes playing with them, hanging out with them, letting their bio, biology settle down, letting them relax and get that blood flow from their muscles in reduce that um, uh, adrenaline flow from being outside. And then I would feed them. And then what do we all do after breakfast? Well, most of us don't do it after breakfast, but after a nice Thanksgiving dinner, we all sleep, right? So this was, <laughs> this was just a really natural way for me to set my dogs up to reduce stress so that when I left for work, they were crashed out. They were having a nice nap. Um, so <clears throat> hold on to intervene a little bit. I know you guys have questions. We're going to answer all your questions. That's my turn. <clears throat> so you basically what you do is you go through their natural circle their social circle, the personal intimate circle, like you in person creating a secure attachment relationship, going out with you, like a family kind of thing. Then we eliminate the need for prey drive, going and explore. Prey drive doesn't mean always going out to kill. The need to explore, a need to co-progress, search, sniff, getting information. Fill up your brain with all these newsletters, emails, faxes with how everybody pees around, like sniffing what everybody has to say about the neighborhood. And then you're coming back home, back into calmness. Yes. And then since they've done so much stuff, they're going to bed, chew and stuff, and you're ready to go. Yes. <laughs> okay, just summing up here. Just like anything I yeah. missed? No. No, absolutely perfect. And it's... Um, you know, the, the, the cycle continues, but, um, you know, obviously coming home from work, taking them out for another walk, having a, you know, another bite to eat and then cuddle time and chew time and things like that. But if we meet those, so if I had not left or after the walk, if I had left before the walk, my dogs would, if I, you know, her of hers, if I'd fed them and then left, they might be sitting there with a full colon and a full bladder, feeling very stressed out, going, I gotta do uh, this. Got a bark, got a bark, got a bark, got a bark. Right. Scratch. Um, <laughs> yeah. Really unhappy, really stressful. Um, if I had just, you know, if I'd fed them, taken them out for a quick piddle and possibly a poop, you know, 
then they'd be sitting there going, wow, I'm so bored. I'm so bored. You know, where's, where's my, uh, you know, video game. I'm going to stand here at the window and I'm going to be looking out there and I'm going to be, you know, barking at everything that goes by because I'm so bored. Right. Um, possibly even they're going to be, you know, as they watch me step out the door, buddy, buddy, buddy. Um, He's just giving an example how it sounds like. <laughs> right. <laughs> he does need to go out for a walk. There's some Sorry, I kind of here. grabbed you out of your regular routine to get on the show. So my apologies. <laughs> it's on me. Tell them. That's right. I'll buy next treats. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So for... Um, it blah, 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 lost my brain there for a second. So, so even if it, you know, even if I met all of the really simple biological needs, um, I'd probably still be missing some of the important enrichment and social needs. Um, and the, another thing I'll add in here really quickly is we never want to go from an arousal level up here to an arousal level down here suddenly. Well, it takes me two hours to calm down after traffic. I cannot oh my expect God. my dogs to calm down in a minute. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's one thing to calm down, for, you know, if you have a normal daily cycle and you know, you know, after the walk comes breakfast and then we're going to take a nap, your body starts pre-programming that and starts saying, oh, I'm going to calm down now because it's time for a nap, right? If if we're suddenly jerking our dogs around from stage to stage, it takes them a lot longer to, and, and right, you get that conflict, you get that, you know, the, the pacing back and forth and you get, you know, the biology isn't, um, isn't in sync with the environment. So, you know, if I'm out playing, throwing a ball for my dog, lovely activity, but um, it can be hyper arousing and dogs have trouble calming down from that. So you don't go out and play a really frantic game of ball play right before you go to bed. You let me add, let me add something here. Sorry. Sure. Some dogs have hard time transitioning, uh -huh. especially guardian breeds yeah. from one event to the other. Here's why. How many times have you speed and got a ticket and how long does it take you? To speed up again maybe a week or two so your transition time after getting a ticket lasts about two weeks right. and then you're gonna speed again so for a guardian breed who has to protect his flock his area his property his family if he would be so easy transitioning he would like ah oh, get out of my yard and then be cool about it it's not gonna work like that because the threat is still out there so he's bred not to let go and hard time transitioning because he should be alert and continue being alert for a long period of time so the threat doesn't enter by accident. Yeah. So it's not because the dogs are stupid, right? And it's not because people cannot, it's because we have bred them to not be able to make those easy changes. So there is no timer on that. It's a sequence of events. If the dog doesn't calm down, you're not done yet. Yeah, yeah, and there's lots of things that we can do to help them calm down, you know, our own body language, um, you know, how we deliver treats. If we're using treat-based training, we can use massage. We can use, um, it, you know, <laughs> I I use a little lavender spray um, to- Hold on, clarification. That's not to spray the dog for barking. It's oh. to make the dog feel comfortable, just saying. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yes, I put like five, ten drops of lavender in a small little spray bottle, and then I go and I spray my window curtains. And uh, to that's so smart. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I spray in the air like crazy. Yeah, I should do the thing. Yeah, okay, I got this. The Note. tricks we learn from our grandmothers, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so, um, but. Yeah, lots. So I have taught my dogs and lavender is supposed to be naturally calming anyhow, but I help them out because I say, well, when I spray lavender, it means we're going to go take a nap. We're going to, your guys are going to lay down and nothing exciting is going to happen. Um, I like how, the, how you make the routine. Sorry. I like how you make the routine a ritual. Yeah. The, I like that transition. 
lovely. Oh my God. So it, sparking all kinds of ideas here. We know that in, in Carolina Westland, who's a, another incredible person, um, was just talking about this. Um, routine can be very boring. It can also be very comforting. Kills a marriage. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Kills so, your relationship with your dog too. Yeah, yeah. If So it, it's important to look at whether you're dealing with a dog who might be anxious or stressed or scared. Those are really good dogs to have a nice routine with because they get comfort in that routine. And even if something scary is going to happen, they know when it's going to happen so that they can relax the rest of the time. If, in contrast, your dogs are very safe and secure and aren't worried about the world out there, they're not scared of the world out there, then routine is boring and rather punitive. And what they're looking for is a little bit of excitement and novelty and something to explore. And we, we know that with mammals, um, novelty is a primary reinforcer. Right. So um, let me start with a couple of questions. And by the way, um, while Kathleen takes her dogs out, who's needy, you know, dogs learn to know stuff. Um, I recognize when dogs have a secure attachment relationship with their caregiver, they're more flexible and more open to changes of routines and they're more trusting the system yes. rather than trusting themselves. Yeah. That takes a lot of anxiousness out. And I was happy a couple of years back, maybe 10 years back, I was fortunate to be called by my neighbor who had an autistic child to get a dog. Mm -hmm. And I had to find out which dog would be a good fit for that family. And I, I'm telling you, I had no clue what this family is going through. I was seeing a family being with a kid in the bus station. I've never thought of it. So I spent the weekend with them, like a guest, going through their toilets, their bathrooms, their washings, the dishes, the kids, the changes, and sleeping. I literally stayed there for the weekend. Wow. And the first thing that... What dog trainers well, do. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it was important. I didn't want the dog to fail the child, and I didn't want the child to get hurt. It was The child was not really in a good place. So the child would come violent at some point and he was not a young child anymore. So the problem was that the child would get very frustrated and very angry if the bus was late. That was his thing. He wanted to be in time. The time was a factor. And I was thinking, how can I handle that? tantrum that anger towards the mother if the bus is late we're having the dog being next to you at the bus station right like the dog would witness domestic violence right so i can see what from a child that has hard time navigating his emotions what an inaccurate event can trigger that anxiety that fear of death at some point and his sympathetic system totally lashes out and attacks everything in the environment because the bus is late. If a human can do that, what is going in a dog's brain at that moment that he sees you're gone, you're not there to open the crate, you're not there to get into the bathroom, he's going to die in that crate. There's this logical consequence of a five-year-old. If you're not here, you don't love me kind of thing, right? Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. I, don't get me started on crates. We've been really, really encouraging people to move away from crating their dogs because it does take away so much control. And it can, I, I know that dogs will often, you know, crawl underneath the coffee table and stuff like that. They, they do find safety and security in some, you know, in some of those small spaces but remember that when they do that, the door isn't closed. So they have the choice to leave. They have the choice to, you know, if worse comes to worse, they can go poop by the back door. Some dogs won't do that. But, you know, in the, in, in the context that you're talking about, that fear for their life, they don't have a way of, of getting. 
And he wasn't encaged. He wasn't a crate. He wasn't a leash. He wasn't a prong collar. He wasn't a shock collar. The bus was late. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> in other words, if 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 your dog is used to us, and and I put that in because we're gonna see COVID dogs hitting the fan. We are already. It's happening already. Where yeah. dogs being used for you to be always home and suddenly you close the door and leave yeah. and you have expectations for the dog to just take it like nothing happened. Yeah. It's like your partner packs his stuff and leaves and like, hey, honey, where are you going? Honey? <laughs> right? And they don't and even not coming in. back. Right. Forever. I mean, talk about forever. Like 20 minutes and beyond for a dog is forever. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that that's... um. I, that's, you know, it's, it's really important for us. Fortunately, dogs are very flexible and they learn and we can, we can help them to learn all of these new things. But with the COVID dogs and with dogs who have separation anxiety or even puppies who don't have separation anxiety, it's super important for us to, you know, just get them used to us leaving for a couple of seconds. And, and Everybody hears this. We say this all the time, but but when we talk to our regular dog owner audience or even a lot of trainers, they think, oh, I need to leave for a half an hour and then come back to get my dog used to it. And as you pointed out, <laughs> 20 minutes is forever. Like when we're talking a little puppy or a dog who's never been left alone, you know, going to the bathroom and shutting the door behind you might be too much. You might just want to, you know, like I, I, I started out by leaving my office door or office and, you know, walking down the hallway, closing the baby gate so they could still see me going to the kitchen, grabbing my cup of coffee and coming back. Like, so that level of separation, you know, is less than a minute. They could see me, you know, so we started with that. And then we progress to leaving for longer. I think some children are smarter than some trainers. It's very, very great observations. My grandson says, if one year is like seven for a dog, maybe one hour is like seven hours for a dog. Man, this is a future colleague. <laughs> Get him out there. <laughs> That's um, right. I, I want to be training with him. Because I, I, so, I think, boy, I'm I'm one of these people that I love ideas and I can run with them. I think a lot of what we we as trainers, we go and we read all the books and we go and we listen to gurus and we do all this stuff and we believe what we're told and we forget what we learned as humans, as children with our own dogs. And our first teacher needs to be our dogs. Our first teacher needs to be our client dogs. Our, you know, second teacher needs to be our human clients. It's absolutely critical that we go out there and we learn what is, what the state of knowledge is. Like I'm a geeky scientist. I've got a doctorate. I know what we know as a, as the official level of knowledge. But then as you started out this talk, there's so much more to know and there's so much more to do. And we need to be you know, art precedes science. Us as practitioners of the art of dog training need to be saying, oh, science tells me this, but then that leaves these 12 questions open. And, you know, what happens if I use a blueberry for a reward versus, you know, a... No, 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 no. So, sorry, sorry. I have to interrupt you here. You cannot use blueberries for dog training because we don't have scientific evidence that blueberries work for. <laughs> you know what I'm talking exactly. about, right? Exactly. So, yeah. I have, have many times. Yeah, right. I mean, again, I'm science nerd. I have hard time reading. I have ADD. If something is longer than 15 sentence, you lost me right in the beginning on the title. I am kind of a title reader, but I'm trying to kind of cross read, try to understand the context. If I have to read scientific papers and then I have to find out what's the main idea of this person? What dogs did they use? There are so many factors. So scientific evidence is such a narrow screenshot yeah. of a scientist experience of a screenshot of few dogs sample of 750 million dogs out there yeah. 
and I can only three dogs. In other words, I'm in New York, I'm observing five people on the elevator, push that emergency stop button, take their phones away, and then observe humanity. That's what we're talking about. So I like I like your approach and I like the way you express it. And our time is short. I think we should do a second part because A, we're totally in alignment here. We use just different words for the same thing. We're coming from the same angle. Like yeah. we're talking about our agriculture, you're raising tomatoes and I'm raising fruits, but we, we do the same thing from different angles. So I love to put down some things and answer a couple of questions of people because I was one of those trainers, just like you said before, who was science oriented. So people told me that scientific evidence is that shock color works. And I was like, okay, if that scientific evidence is true, I work it. And I didn't search for it. And back then I felt intimidated not to use one because that's what you do. You're a strong trainer. You work with aggressive breeds. If you don't, if you don't use a color, like you are kind of like, uh, right? That kind of person. And I was like, I don't I, want to be I, that person. Right? I, I, I did hunting dogs and the same right? thing. E -collars and are standard it was a shocking dogs. experience to me <laughs> when I recognized <laughs> that I was so proud of something that I wasn't proud of after. Right. And it took me a lot, and I appreciate you because you t shared with me, and actually you did it right now too, is to admit that we went the wrong route. We thought it's something right. We adjusted it, but we had the courage to put our pants down and clean our butt <laughs> with what we did and then try to turn it around and take this as an experience. I'm not, blaming, I'm not blaming other colleagues who use that route. I'm blaming them for not listening to us who got dirty with it. Learn okay. from the experience of and, others. And we got important. out of there and I don't regret it. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I was thinking, oh, maybe I should. And then I was like, no, it's an ethical question. Okay. If it was so easy to push the button, then we're missing the point of the dog having the experience of learning it error free. Yeah. And this is where the circle closes up. If you don't let the dog learn as the way his evolutionary process learned, from his non-mistakes, because I'm telling you something here, and I'm sure you agree and everybody agrees here. A dog who went after the wrong species and made an error would not be able to survive to tell about it. The only one who survived is who wasn't with errors. And so over these 4 million generations, at least not more, 4.5 million generations of dogs have evolved errorless. Hmm. I would say, well, yeah. <laughs> certainly there's ways of making errors and occasionally surviving. Right. But <laughs> error, not with the thing you're going to kill you. Right. Making adjustments is one thing, but the yeah. error means fatal error. The fatal, fatal errors. Yeah. It's you're out of the gene pool. Goodbye. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't make it through, man. So um, <laughs> how do you feel about answering your questions? We have 10 minutes. Um, I'd love to answer questions. Let me just say that that um, error-free living, I just want to say, watch your dogs, pay attention to your dog's natural cycle. This is something that we as trainers, as dog owners, are still learning about. Um, you know, I find, again, you know, walk, dinner, nap, or walk, breakfast, nap works really, really well. Walk, chewy breakfast nap walk breakfast you know social time then a chewy and then a nap you know works really well and we can work that into the daily cycle um listen to your dogs though your dogs may you know they may be a 10 a.m you know rise and shine kind of dog whereas my dogs are you know that sun comes over the hill and my dogs are gung-ho and ready to go i totally agree with you on that um, I have also to add for those people who just got puppies, remember that little the puppies, <laughs> yeah, right? They have these little cycles, like every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes, every an hour. So it's not about your convenience. It's teaching the dog that there is a circle. The circle will fulfilled. All your needs are met. You don't need to worry about it. I take care of you. Makes me the pack leader? No, makes me a parent. Mm. A surrogate that. parent. 
a parent who took away the puppy from another parent and takes over responsibility just as if he would be one. So the puppy cannot tell you, you're not my parent. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> because there's nothing else that you need right now. Right. So super appreciate that. Um, so let me I have some questions here for people that start very early asking questions that were eager to learn. I like that. <laughs> So meanwhile, you can tell me, can we learn that? Do you guys have classes? Do you do personal in-person sessions? How does this work? Yeah, I'm, boy, I'm a, a technophobe and, and uh, a lot of things are um, a struggle for me. So I will say I do in-person uh, consults. I also do online consults. I love working with people one-on-one. -on -one. We have a bunch of trainers. Um, who work with me, who also do the online consults. Um, and that's all available on our 101 Dog Spots page. We also have a couple of online classes. Right now, the online classes, we have a Puppy Essentials, which is my way of preparing puppies for existence. Um, I'm a behavior consultant. So, you know, you're not going to walk out the door with an obedience <laughs> no. uh, star. <laughs> but I don't like walk... obedience. Sorry. It's not, yeah, it's not I'm not thing. big on obedience. You're going to walk out the door with a dog who's happy and comfortable and loves you and is good with life. Um, that's our goal. Um, and then we do have an obedience class, but it's from the same kind of perspective. Um, and we developed that because so many of the humans want to have very specific behaviors. Um, so those are online and we are working to put together, we have a lot of free information available on our 101, a dog training 101 Facebook group. And then I'm working to get my, all of my protocols that I've developed available for just a couple of dollars um, online. So if somebody has got a problem with jumping up or something like that, they can just download one of these things and, and, um, and you know then ask questions <laughs> so we're so we have this. zita she asks how to transition this process to another target like window reactivity when dogs walks by great question um so obviously i'm gonna say meet your dog's need for entertainment and stimulation this is there's many many reasons a dog might be reactive to dogs walking by uh, the window um, a lot of them are, you know, we talked about that boredom kind of issue. Um, but there's also things like fear and a startle response as, you know, you've got a window and this person appears suddenly, um, or a dog appears suddenly. So you can reduce the startle effect, you know, uh, by putting some film over your windows, um, the problem with that is, is that we are then taking away the dog's TV and part of the dog's world. We are limiting their access to normal stimulation, which they need. So you're going to need to make sure to address that lack of stimulation. I have a, um, a process that I call coffee shop, which is, I, I use this for everybody. I love it. We get outside. <laughs> See the background. <laughs> no, it's mine. <laughs> um, we, I, with these dogs, we get outside to a place that they can handle. They're not freaking out. And we just watch the world go by. We just enjoy the world. I might be reading a book. 110% of my attention is on the dog, but I'm also drinking my cup of coffee. I've got my feet up. I'm relaxing. And the dog is getting reinforced and rewarded for, you know, looking at the world or for orienting on me. I, I don't want and expect him to be oriented on me all the time. I do want him to check out what's going on in the world because he needs that. He's part of the world. He's not. Yeah, just we don't need a caught up in a dog. We need a, a free dog. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I use. Um, there's lots of actual training protocols that we can use, but make sure to get those needs met for entertainment first. And that's going to make your training go much, much easier. Okay. For you guys, when entertainment doesn't fit right in the mind, use the word enrichment. Oh, yes. 
Now, Absolutely. another question here is, Caitlin, you mentioned earlier, um, could you please explain a little bit about recall with respect to this? We had a little recall Hubble's recently, which threw me a bit, and I'd love to look at it from this perspective. Yeah, great question. So recall, just note that most of the time when you're out there with your dogs and you recall them, you're recalling them off of something fun, off of something they want they to do. They have a job description. I'm totally proud of it. <laughs> I'm being the lawyer here. You're right. <laughs> yes. So if our dogs have freedom of choice and all, every single time you call them, you're calling them away from that fun bunny or the bubble gum machine or the poop pile or any of these things that they love, they're not dumb. They're going to figure it out pretty quick and pretty quick. They're going to go. Yeah. Every time I find something fun, mom's going to yell at me and I have to go to her and they're not going to want to come to you. So switch the way you think about recall. You get out there, please. If you can find a place to go off leash um, where there's, you know, I don't like dog parks, but off leash is really, really good. If you can find it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you can, uh, it, it, what I want you to do with your recall is I want you to stop calling your dog all the time. If I'm taking my dogs for a walk and I know that they're going to be done with their walk in about 30 to 40 minutes at about 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to start walking back to home, breakfast, nap. All of these biological needs, which have started to rise while they're out on their walk, right? Their need for mental entertainment has gone down because we've sated that need and their need for, you know, a drink, a cooling spot. My dogs love the horse water trough, um, a cooling spot to lay down, a snack and a nap. All of those needs have gone up. So I'm going to turn around. I'm going to walk towards home and then I'm going to call them. I'm going to call them to meet their next biological need. In contrast, if I want to work on an emergency recall, a, a recall that works, calling them off of the poop pile and the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or the snake. Or cetera, the snake. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I have bird dogs, right? So think about what your dog loves more than anything else in the world. Something that is exciting, sexier than a squirrel, right? This is where sexier than a squirrel comes in. I'm going to call my dogs when I've got a bird in my back pocket when I have a mouse underneath the bush, I, I do very low kill hunting, right? But I'm going to say, oh my God, look, you know, come on guys, let's check this out. And then I'm going to whip that bird out of my pocket and I'm going to, your dog might be a terrier. He might do this for a toy. You know, I'm going to whip that toy around and I'm going to play tug and I'm going to run away from him. And we're going to get that high arousal, high excitement, high drive kind of stuff going on. I might do this on a walk a couple of times when my dogs are a little bit bored, when they're doing something that isn't that exciting. And so what I'm doing is I'm producing a contrast effect so that my dogs a think, vacuum. yes, beautiful. My dogs think, oh my God, she knows where all the good stuff is. Every time she calls us, it means something incredible. And this, you have to do this at least nine times for every time you call them away from the real bunny or the real poop pile. Now, small caveat here. Remember that if we repeat something too much, it becomes boring. So your exciting, sexier than a squirrel recall needs to be something you use judiciously. <laughs> I would say a few times a week at the most. Um, when you're first training it, yeah, sure. Train four or five times a day, three or four days a week. And then after a month or two, you, you slow down a lot. So since you guys are everybody's focused right now and everybody wants more information, here's our toy. When will you be available next time to do the next An level? Of another it? one of these. Can we put it, can we do it in about a month? That will Good. <laughs> Okay. So guys, are you guys ready? Are you guys sniffing at it? 
ready for it? She's already swinging. Next month, we're going to do the follow-up from here. I'm going to start basically a quick overview of what we talked about today. And of course, you guys are smart. You already saved that video in your, your Facebook or YouTube channel. And then we're going to talk about those good questions that are coming in here because I know you're smart. You kind of sneak it in. Oh, yeah, with that context, how can you fix my dog's problem? Well, you're going to sit down and listen to it because next time we're going to talk about it. So um, can we use another word for sexy? Yeah, sexy. <laughs> Sounds better, right? Okay. So, Caitlin, I so appreciate you. Thank you, guys. You were complaining. You guys are just locals where we have Australia, we have um, um, Washington, we had from Canada, we had from South Africa, Massachusetts. Wow. And that's in America, by the way, for you guys who don't know that. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, we had super questions. I love you guys. So I super appreciate you. Thank you so much for super information. Um, I know more now. It's been I, lovely to talk with you, Roman. I love that we are simpatico. That we yeah, right. You know what? It's, it's kind of a time of synchronicity. We, we have to open up and share what we know because it's not about us. If I die, if you die, somebody else has to follow through with it. Yeah. So we need to share it now. It's not about us. It's about the dogs. We That's need to true. raise this consciousness from the dog. The dogs are here to serve humanity. My dog serves me or something like that into the next level. Hey, we have a synergistic relationship here. It's not just about you. You have a dog in your house. You should be appreciated. It's not a right. It's an obligation hmm. towards the dogs. And it, it can be such a beautiful, fun relationship right. if we give and take, you know? It's absolutely. Good. So you guys know what to do? You follow us. You follow the YouTube channels subscribe so you get the updates you don't say oh i didn't know i missed it okay and see you guys in a month look out for those dates and if you subscribe you're not going to miss it at all and thank you so much good anything closing i don't think so i'm really eager to see your questions and and um i'd love to it, this is a developing idea. So if you have yeah, right. some ideas. It started with a freaking sandwich and then end up with a coffee and who knows where it goes. <laughs> if you guys, um, you know, tell me what you see with your dogs. I really, really want to know. That's science starts with observation. Let's get the, let's get the, the foundation down so we can get to paving the road so everybody can have access to this. Thank you guys. Have a great rest of your weekend.